There are millions of acres of opportunity out there. They belong to you. Every day, decisions are being made that affect your land, your water, your wildlife. You should know about them. This is your mountain. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Your Mountain Podcast. I am your host, David Wilms, and I am alone hosting today. I have no Mike McGrady. I have no Nephi Cole. The world is my oyster. I can go anywhere I want with this thing, uh, which means I'll probably completely screw it up because they're not here. So because of that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I've got a co-host today, a new, we'll call him a... uh, um, a stand-in or a guest guest co-host of the Your Mountain Podcast. Uh, and you might recognize this person. Uh, he's been on twice. It was a, it was a two-parter. Uh, go back and it was, uh, I can't remember the exact episode, but it was... Uh, I think 17 and 21. I'm not oh. 100% <laughs> sure then. <laughs> just, just guessing. You think it's 17 and 21? <laughs> Four lawyers and Nephi walk into a bar from that fame, Mr. Chris Timeson. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Thanks for joining. Uh, happy to be back. I'm happy to have you back. We uh, only want you back because you're so good the first time and the second time. Probably the top rated shows before. Uh, you know. Or that, close. If that's what you want to believe, we'll <laughs> let you believe it. Uh, calling us a top rated show generally is uh, uh, maybe misplaced. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, but in any event, appreciate uh, you coming on. So we're in. Uh, just you know, so folks know, we are in your home state right now, uh, sitting in Manhattan, Kansas. I've been calling it all week the Little Apple. Is that the right way I'm supposed to refer to? Yes, it? it's referred to as the Little Apple. All right, that's what I thought. The Little Apple of Manhattan, home of K State University, right in the heart of the Flint Hills, in the middle of the Flint Hills. In uh, Kind of up in northeast, the generally in the northeast part of the state. Northeast part of the state, correct. Yeah. Um, and I got to say, so we're here for the, the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies um, summer meeting. The uh, Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies is this, I think we've talked about this before, but it's this association of 19 western states and three Canadian provinces. Uh, that It's been around since the 1920s, and they they meet twice a year. Uh, and folks from the respective states come together, but also folks from the non-government organizations and federal agencies and uh, and private businesses, and they all come together to talk about solutions to some of our uh, uh, some of the wildlife challenges, wildlife issues that we're facing all over the West and frankly around the country too. So it's it's a place right now that is full of wildlife professionals from all over uh, the West and all over the country right now. Yep, and the reason why we're in Kansas is because every state takes a turn hosting it, and this is Kansas' turn. And it is, yeah, and I appreciate uh, all you've done to make this a memorable experience here. Uh, We've had a pretty good time in the last couple of days over the weekend. I would, so. s- Yeah, I would say so. I mean, so I got uh, you set up a, a phenomenal fishing trip. Right. For us. So Saturday night after our meetings were over, we went out and uh, caught a few wipers. Wipers on top on Milford Lake. So we're right next to two lakes, two major reservoirs. And uh, one of them is really famous for the wiper bite. Yeah, why don't you explain, for those that don't know, what a wiper is? It's a striped bass, white bass hybrid. And so actually we're here close by. We have a hatchery. And uh, they've perfected uh, wiper production. So we've got brood stock of stripers in the raceways, and then we bring in wild white bass and uh, uh, hybridize the species. So, of course, they can't reproduce in the reservoir, but then we stock them. So they uh, I was going to ask you that. So the, the wipers don't reproduce. They're not reproducing. They're hybrids, so they can't reproduce. Okay. Okay. So it's it, you continually have to stock. Yep. yep. Okay. And so... When we went out Saturday night, uh, those wipers were schooling shad to the top, and we were casting out into the into that boil of fish, and uh, uh, we probably caught four different year classes of fish. Really, I, I, I maybe you did. 
Well, I did. <laughs> yes. Mine were all six pounds. We were on different boats. Yeah, but, mine, yeah. mine were all gigantic. <laughs> <laughs> they were the old age class. Maybe you caught some of the little guys, too. There were a few little guys that were caught on our boat. I actually didn't catch any. I caught all eight pounders. <laughs> oh, so. eight pounders. That's yeah. what I meant. I was like nine pounds or what I was <laughs> right, catching. Nine right. pounders. Lots of nine pounders. But they're a phenomenal sport fish. Unbelievable. The fight that they put up. It's right. They incredible. have strong shoulders. But in that reservoir, we've also got blue cats. Yeah, we've uh, got so. several of those, too. Uh, the I think the lake record's about 84 pounds for a blue cat. So they get pretty big, and we've instituted a slot limit on that length, on that lake. Uh, and so you can't keep anything. I think it's 25 to 40 inches, which talk, you're talking about a 10 to 30-pound fish in that range. And so uh, those fish continue to get bigger and bigger. It's become it's become nationally famous as a blue cat lake. And it's also got smallmouth bass and walleye, and it's just a phenomenal lake. Oh, and it's beautiful, too. I mean, Gorgeous. So I'm going to – and that's what we want to talk about on this podcast. Some is I, I just want to talk about Kansas a bit and the wildlife opportunities here in Kansas. And as a reminder, before we get into that, as a reminder, tell everybody what you do. So I'm the chief attorney for the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks, and Tourism. This is my 20th year with the agency. Uh, handle a variety of topics, handle legislation, litigation, regulations, c- some constituent services, so a wide variety of things. So constituent services, services um, does that mean setting up a fishing trip for folks <laughs> that, are, <laughs> that are out here from Wafla? No, but it <laughs> means when people are mad, they get routed to yeah. me, <laughs> and I have to answer their questions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was a, you know, maybe, maybe that was a, that's just an extra perk. At the yeah, job. that's just my hospitality. That's the hospitality set for you. Know, what is the what? You know, most states have a um, you know for tourism purposes have a you know some sort of a you know, tagline about that state to remember them. You know, what's the what's Kansas's? Well, you know, the old one is like uh, no place like home, right? Ah, yeah. Coming from the land original of, or the land of Oz, or <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. we've had a bunch of them over the years, so. Yeah. Uh, but Kansas is pretty diverse. Uh, people ask why we're a member of Wafwa, as you discussed. And really, when you look at like the western third of our state, it's high, it fits in the High Plains region of the United States, which leads into the Rockies. And then on the eastern two thirds, or you know, so we have really kind of an eastern management philosophy of how we manage our wildlife. So, uh, any actually any all the way from the Dakotas down to Texas is like that, you know, the, that western third of those states, really the philosophy is like a western wildlife management philosophy. Can you explain the difference between that, a western and an eastern philosophy on wildlife management? Well, I mean, so when you're talking about whitetails or, or deer in particular, you know, t- as you go east, whitetails are more abundant and over-the-counter permits and I think as you look in this range of states from the Dakotas down to Texas, not not necessarily Texas, but the philosophy is more of a drawing and a, a more uh, unitized management. I don't think you have that in some of those eastern states. You may now actually with, as whitetail populations have grown and grown, and uh, you can take so many uh, whitetails in those eastern states versus what we can hunt out west it's just a, a different philosophy it was a i think i've thought a lot about this in in relation just to missouri and kansas and and i st- shot my first deer in missouri and it was anybody could get a permit and it could be a buck only wh- when i did it and it was a social event a family event and then when i moved to kansas and i went to law school I had difficulty figuring out how to get a deer permit because I had no concept of a of, of a draw system. I just came in, bought a permit over the counter at a store in Missouri, and then I came here and it was like I said I would like to hunt deer, and uh, my head was spinning because it was you have to draw for a permit and f- you got to know where you're going to hunt f- before you just get a permit, as opposed to just getting a permit and then finding your place to hunt in Missouri. So. Uh, I, I think those are definitely two different management philosophies. I don't think one's 
worse or better. Yeah, it's yeah. not just that. It's just, and then I don't think that in Kansas, for example, that you had that social, uh, social aspect to deer hunting. It was more solitary. Um, you may have a group of people who hunt together every year or whatever, but uh, we, when I came to Kansas, we had limit. It was limited to like four people for non-residents or five who could draw together in a group. And in Missouri, when I would hunt with cousins, and there would be fifteen people or twenty people plus other people. Like my great aunt would come out and she would uh, cook breakfast on the open fire and. So, and it was at a cabin uh, that my great uncle had on his property, and that's where we slept. And, we, you know, so it was very, very social. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily about, I mean, people wanted to shoot a deer, but it was all the social activity that accompanied it. I think there's that in the West, too. Well, I think you have you know, that, yeah. A, Camps and st- you go yeah. to deer camp and stuff like that. But uh, I was just in relation to Kansas versus Missouri and the two systems. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, you still have that in Kansas, but it's not. I think as you get farther west into the mountains, you definitely have the, the. Um, I'm going to go set up camp somewhere else as opposed to staying in somebody's house or a small cabin and, you know. So yeah, so it that. depends. Like being from Wyoming, right? The 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 way you hunt might be different depending on the type of species you hunt uh, and the type of person you are, right? You kind of what you're looking for out of the hunt. But there's definitely, um, I've definitely been on hunts where I've stayed in somebody's house and it's been a big social event in Wyoming. But I've also done the you know deep in the backcountry elk hunt where you know, there's just a couple of us out there, uh, and it's not. It's not a social event. It's a go out and and chase down and kill an elk kind of an event. I mean, that's the motivation. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. but you know, here in Kansas, we have mule deer and whitetails. We got mule deer in our western third, which again lends us to a western management philosophy on how we're managing those mule deer. Although we've got whitetails that range throughout the state, you know, we always predominantly think of white tails as an eastern part of the state species even though they're not but and then we've got antelope and they're on that western third of the state and we've got elk in kansas uh, actually elk right close here in manhattan we're next door to fort riley and fort La- fort riley was a reintroduction site for elk and so we've got a hunting season with elk on fort riley and then we had elk in the southwest part of the state and then you had or have had have sort of have they go back and forth between Colorado and uh, Kansas and we have a large swath of public ground of Kansas only is 90 has 97 percent private ownership so only three percent public ground isn't it the most uh the most from a percentage standpoint the highest percentage of private ownership in the in country the country yes which so, that has to create some management challenges. Landowners are our partners yeah. in in management. There's no doubt. So private land ownership. It's important that we manage in conjunction with private owners, private landowners. And uh, so, how do you do that? I'm I'm just kind of curious because you know coming from a state that's you know got so much public land, you know, then coming to a state here where, I mean. And we'll talk about this more, but the diversity of wildlife in Kansas is pretty remarkable. It, it, it kind of surprised me how much, how much wildlife and diversity of wildlife you have. Uh, but in order to have, in order to be able to manage it and to be able to manage populations, and, and to have hunting seasons, um, you you have to have that landowner cooperation. Is there? You know, how do you how do you do that? Our people are out engaging landowners on a one on one basis every day. I mean, that's just how we have to do it, and you know, public meetings and take feedback at commission meetings and work with the legislature, the legislature, you know, if landowners are unhappy, they go to the legislature and the legislature relays that to us in some form or fashion. I mean, so working with private landowners is super important in everything that we do. So this elk herd in the Southwest would go back and forth and then the landowners on the Colorado side complained that it got too big. And so Colorado opened up a season so that population is reduced 
but we also have other populations of elk that seem to be cropping up migrants that come from Nebraska or from Colorado or Oklahoma in and you know Missouri's looking at opening an elk season so although their elk are farther east and they're not moving into the eastern part of our state so we've got two traditional strongholds of elk and then some outliers that are roaming through do you have any idea how many elk you have I think on Fort Riley which is our biggest population it's about 250 so it's very limited. It's a super limited resource. We share it with Fort Riley, so soldiers from Fort Riley can draw and uh, general Kansas residents can draw. But it's super limited. And so you've drawn it like half a dozen times as the, <laughs> right. as the, as the, as the attorney for... <laughs> it's a once-in-a-lifetime, actually, a bull permit. So Didn't you draw a bull permit? I did. I drew a bull permit. You have to apply to draw, but okay. yes, I drew a bull permit. So you have to apply and then know the people that uh, no, run the draw. that's not how things work. And I know that's how that works. I have been right. on the inside. I know how that works. Yeah. So <laughs> Just kidding. I know that's not how it works. I, maybe I shouldn't plant that seed that that's right. how it works. I know that you had to draw just like anybody else had to draw. Yeah, actually, I, residents have a pretty good odd of drawing, if you think about it, because I apply for... Wyoming, for example, and uh, I've applied for units that have less than a 1% chance of drawing uh, just in the hopes that you're going to draw. But uh, as it is in Kansas, when it, I think when our first elk season started, I don't know the exact year, I think it might have been 1995, we had lots and lots of applicants, but we only have about 25 permits. So you end up, I think most recently I looked at the draw odds for last year in there were like a thousand applicants for twenty five permits. So it's that's it, right? So it's really not that bad. How do how do you only have a thousand applicants? For People just get permits? discouraged o- over the years and just fall away from the drawing. Really, it's kind of crazy. Wow. And then you know, I was I'm always asking my friends, "Did you apply?" Nah, I forgot, or you know, they just think it's so beyond p- the possible. Right, like it's just. Because there's so few tags, and it's a once in a lifetime, they just assume ah, I'm not going to draw. So why even try? Right. The year I drew, there were 930 applicants. Wow. Right. Wow. The area where you and I elk hunted together in Wyoming a couple of years ago. Right. I mean, that unit alone had 1,700 permits. Right, but I was going to say it had um, over 4,000 applicants. Yeah. Just yeah. for the unit. Just for that one. There unit. were more permits in that unit than we had applicants in Kansas for those permits. There might be more permits in that unit than there are, than there are elk in Kansas. Yes, there are. Actually, I would agree with that. Huh. Interesting. Yep. So, and then we have, uh, you know, those antelope on the western side of the state, and it takes a resident about six or seven years, depending on the year, to draw, maybe eight years. So, uh you know, it's not like going to Wyoming where you've got lots of antelope, but again, you've got to seek out some private landowner access, and and most people will allow you to hunt antelope out there. So I, I got, I just gotta say this, I gotta throw this out there. So I was, there was a time in my life, and it's not that long ago, uh, where I had a joke that I told frequently about Kansas, and I used it on other states too, right? And I, it was typically applied to, to state. I, I would, I would, I would use the joke for Kansas. I'd use the joke for um, Nebraska. Um, I might still use it for Iowa. I don't know. You know the joke, right? So I told you this one. Yes. You know, and I've always just referred to Kansas as, you know, it's that place where you can sit on your back porch, and watch your dog run away, for three days. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think you're seeing a different part of Kansas. I though. clearly we're, am. So we're in the Flint Hills. We're in the and the Flint Hills are amazing. Yeah. And they're just beautiful. And and other parts of Kansas have a lot of topography to it as well. Right. So I think that's a there's a misnomer about Kansas being just you know flat cornfields all the way across the state. Uh, it's wheat. We would have wheat if you were. I saw a lot of corn. There's corn, but a lot of corn. I know I saw some wheat driving too, but there's a lot of corn out there right now. So I grew up in Northwest Iowa. And it's kind of rolling hills where I grew up. And I think you have the same here. There's such diversity in this state where we talk about that management philosophy for whitetails and mule deer and how we 
how some species are considered western species, you know, iconic western species. And But in the northwest part of our state, we've got the Arikari Breaks, which is like a miniature badlands. And then in the southeast, far southeast corner, we've got the Ozark Plateau. So we've got like, it looks like the Ozarks. It's so in between, it's just an amazing diversity of what we have. I think there are 12 ecotype systems in Kansas. Yeah, I haven't seen any... Uh like the only thing I'm not really seeing is the high alpine tundra stuff. Right, right. Yeah. No high alpine tundra. Not, not seeing a lot of that. I think Mount Sunflower, which is our highest point, is about 4,000 feet. So oh, that's higher than I would have thought. It's uh, it's just a little rise in western Kansas. I've been there. It's pretty neat. Uh, you can see Colorado from there, I think, 100 yards away. Yeah. But uh, I think we're probably around 1,000 or 900 feet in elevation here. Okay, so it's... You know, summiting the high peak in in Kansas isn't something I need to worry about checking off my list anytime well, soon. Well, you should check it off. I should check anyway. it off my list, but I don't need. I'm not going to break a big sweat. No, you wouldn't break a big sweat. I think you can actually drive up to it. It's on private land, and the landowners are very generous to allow people to come up. and There's a book you sign, and oh, that's it's, great. It's actually pretty neat. That's pretty neat. So it's another example of landowner partnerships yep. promoting. That's more promoting tourism, Kansas tourism, right? right? Kansas tourism. Yeah. It's just south of Goodland on I-70 if you wanted to stop and get off. I may do that on the way home. Right. It's not too far. It's about 20 miles, maybe south out of your way. Oh, that's n- that's no big deal to, s- to say I hit the highest point in, in right. Kansas. Right. Yeah. There are lots of people who hit all those high points in every state and got to come through Kansas. I still haven't hit the high point in Wyoming yet. And what is the high point in Wyoming? High point, Gannett Peak. So it is, it, so Gannett Peak is in the Wind River Range in northwestern Wyoming. And it is one of, depending on who you talk to, what resource you read, uh, it is the second or third or fourth kind of in that range most difficult high peak to summit in the United States. You know, behind right, Denali, and I think Denali is always number one. I don't know how you approach Denali. Uh, you know, how do you classify it, other, anything but number one. But the, the difficulty with Gannett is the remoteness of the peak. I mean, it is a, it's a about a twenty mile pack in to a wilderness area to get to base camp before you climb it, and then you climb the largest glacier in the the Rocky Mountains of the lower forty eight. Right, um, so you got to have it's a time of year issue. You got to have your crampons and ice axe, and you need really should have a rope with you so um, it's a technical climb it's not a technical climb it's not like you're it's not a roping in um you know anchoring into you know granite faces and climbing in that respect it's more of a you're on a glacier and if you got multiple people there you want to be roped in for safety's sake um to each other right you mm-hmm. know so in case you slip and fall into a crevasse or something um it's du- it's on my list of things to do, uh, and I'm hoping we can talk some buddies into doing it next year. But you, things have to go right to do it. I mean, it's you have to plan enough time, and then the weather has to hold so you can actually do the summit. And you need to build in some extra time in case the weather, you know, turns on you. And you, ha- you miss a day before you can you know, make the ascent. So, it's uh, just under fourteen thousand feet, like just a handful of feet under fourteen thousand feet. Um, but it, it's, it's one that I intend to do. You're welcome to join me. I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind, but we'll just see if it. It's not on the, my bucket list. Tell you right what, I'll now. join you on the Kansas summit, and then you join me on the Wyoming <laughs> summit. <laughs> we'll do them together. We'll about nine thousand feet in elevation difference. Oh, so. but we'll do them both together. We can both check those boxes. <laughs> yeah, you maybe already have checked the Kansas box. I have checked. The Kansas okay. Box. Well, you can do it. Then you can be my guide. Right. Yeah. Right. Is, it, is there a Wilderness area there in western Kansas? No, yeah. no wilderness area. Just a little drive up to a piece of pasture. Nice. So we're here in the Flint Hills, and the Flint Hills uh, run basically from the northern part of the state back all the way down to Oklahoma, and Kansas has about 95% of its... The Flint Hills are the heart of the tall grass prairie. So we have tall grass prairie, mixed grass prairie, short grass prairie in Kansas as you go farther west, and this is... The, the tall grass prairie and as settlement occurred in the eastern united states the tall grass prairie was broken out and uh so we've got 
virtually, like I said, 95% of tall grass prairie left, and it's in the Flint Hills, and it's because you can't plow the Flint Hills. So it's largely cattle country, big cattle country from here south, just in a narrow band. So what kind of what kind of species uh, f- associate themselves with the tall grass prairie? Uh, so greater prairie chickens. This is greater prairie chicken range. Are you talking about game species? Yeah, let's all? stick with game species. Yeah, yeah. Uh, white tails. We're in white tail country, although... Uh, a little north and west of here, I actually saw a mule deer in a pasture. It was kind of way out. Uh, so there are some big pastures to the north and west of here at a place called Clay Center. And uh, I've hunted out there for many, many years. Um, so, yeah, it's mostly, uh, you know, whether Bob White quail, things like that. So you you touched on, uh, or you just mentioned at least, greater prairie chicken. Um there's a saga around another prairie chicken in Kansas, and I'd like I'd like to touch on it for a little bit sure. anyway. Um, so you have two types of prairie chickens. You have greater prairie chicken. You have lesser prairie chicken. And greater prairie chicken, you you still have hunting seasons for. We do. We have a prairie chicken hunting season. Yeah, uh, but you can't. <coughs> you cannot hunt lesser prairie chicken. So we have an area of Kansas where you just can't hunt prairie chickens. Because so there's an overlap between the two. Because there's an overlap between the two. So sometimes there's hybridization. Uh, I actually got to sit on a lek and watch the courting display this spring. Got up at 4 a.m. and went out and sat in a blind. And there were both greater prairie chickens and lesser prairie chickens on the same lek, which is a pretty amazing experience. So it allows you to, I mean to tell the difference between the two based upon the air sacs and the size, but the recording display is pretty similar. Uh, amazing, amazing experience. And it's a ecotourism opportunity that was set up on a ranch of, that a friend of mine has. And uh, I think uh, I saw him yesterday or two days ago and he said uh, uh, <clears throat> he had 39 states and 11 countries this year. Yeah. You introduced me to him. He said he had, 200 people come out over 200 over 200 to view this lack from yeah 39 states and 11 countries yeah and that wasn't the favorite part of of the story in my mind but the my favorite part of that conversation was so if people go all the way back all the way back to the very first episode of the or mountain podcast we had steven ranella on right and during that conversation you know, I had taken, uh, I say I, we, you know, Mike and Nephi and I had taken um, sage grouse excrement, sage grouse droppings. Right. To Steve right. Ranella. Right. So we took, we, because I had been turned on to this. I'm going to mention again. So those of you that haven't heard that, go back and listen to that episode. But here, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit. So I met this guy, and I'm going to circle back to why. You know, the tie-in to this story here in a second with, with this landowner in Kansas you were talking about, Chris. I, uh, I met this guy in Wyoming, this rancher in Wyoming, uh, probably in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I won't name any names, but I met this guy. He was an old Vietnam War and Korean War fighter pilot. Awesome guy. Amazing guy. Actually, I worked as a biologist on his place uh, when I was uh, as a field biologist. Uh, while I was going through law school, and he he would come out. He had a little plane, you know, a little single engine plane, prop plane, and he would sneak up behind me uh, while I was working in the field and buzz me like ten feet, just <laughs> right over me, scare the ever loving crap out of me. Right, uh, just you know, just an awesome, awesome guy. So I'm having. I take my fa- my kids up. Or one, one daughter up, and we're doing a turkey hunt on his place a couple of years ago. And we're sitting down to dinner, and his wife makes this amazing, amazing dinner. Like up there, it's you just eat meat, it's meat and potatoes, right? Just amazing dinner. Is there anything else? There's nothing else. Not that I'm, I mean, green stuff just take, it's, takes up space, right? Right. I don't know why you put that in your system. My system can't tolerate green stuff. <laughs> I'm um, with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> but so there's this amazing dinner on the table, and we're about to dig in. And this friend of mine, Bob's name, 
He stands up. He said, oh, oh, wait on. Wait, wait a second. Wait a second. Goes into the kitchen. He grabs uh, a Ziploc baggie out of a drawer. And he grabs a little plate. And he puts the plate in the center of the table. And he opens the Ziploc baggie. And he takes out a piece of sage grouse poop. And he puts it right on that plate. And he takes his lighter out. And he lights it. I'm like, Bob, what? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> You have to be curious at that point. At that point, I'm curious. Like I've never seen anything like this. What are you doing? He's like, just you know, just give me a second here. And he lights it, and like, yeah, burning sage grouse poop has this like really refreshing, nice smell to it. Like I actually like burning incense, and each one of those pellets will burn for 15 minutes. And so then I'm I'm like I'm hooked on it. It's like a it's like a drug to me. I'm like I gotta have this stuff, and so I just go sage out. Just sage grouse or just sage grouse and and moose, uh, but I don't collect a lot of moose. I really I have lots. I've got bags of sage grouse droppings. <laughs> <laughs> My wife thinks I'm insane, uh, but I go out to lek visits and I collect all this stuff. Well, you knew that about me. I did. I did. And so you had you know when I was on the lek, I had afterwards. Uh, the birds flew off, and and uh, so I went out and collected a bunch of lesser prairie chicken and greater prairie chicken excrement. Yeah, brought it back in a baggie for you. Yeah, you did. And then I meet this. We so as we're walking through uh, where we were yesterday, and we ran into my friend who was the landowner. Uh, we were having a conversation. I introduced him to Dave, and then he said, "Say." Did you ever get a hold of that guy who wanted the poop? <laughs> and I'm, and like, I'm that guy. <laughs> it was a pretty aha small world moment. <laughs> it's a great small world moment moment. And the thing is, I still haven't burned that. Like I, I'm not gonna burn it. I've made a commitment to myself. I'm not gonna burn it until you and I can burn it together. Uh, and I meant to bring it out here with me so we could do it here, and I forgot. So we'll have to do it this fall when we hunt together. Right, we'll do it this fall. Uh, but I'm excited to see what that smells like. If it's and there, it's a lot smaller. I was kind of surprised how much smaller it is than sage smaller. grouse. And the birds are significantly smaller yeah. than sage grouse. Yeah. So we've got those lesser chickens in the southwest part of the state, and then we've got greater chickens in the eastern part of the state. So can you talk a little bit about the history of lesser prairie chickens in Kansas? Because that's there's a whole saga around that, uh, and. There's some litigation that's currently ongoing uh, on lesser chickens. They were proposed for listing to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service via petition, I think, in 98. And then they rode on that list until the mid-2010s. So to back that out, so they were were petitioned, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service came back and said, yep, they're warranted for listing, because this is something a lot of people don't know they can do this uh, under the Endangered Species Act. There are three different categories. They can they can be well, list, four. They can be list. warranted. Uh, well, there's th- yeah three. Sorry, there's warranted for listing. There's not warranted for listing, and there's warranted for listing but, but precluded, precluded. And it's typically precluded because of higher agency priorities. When they're precluded, they're put on what's called a candidate species list. And so they're still under state con- management when they're a candidate species. But they're rec- on that candidate species, they're categorized based on uh, you know, the, the relative threat level to the, to the species. So they're put in, in a numerical category from a ca- on the candidate species list. Uh, and the service is supposed to review that candidate species list annually every 12 months to do a status review on, that, on those species on the candidate list and see now okay now are they warranted and do we take the butt precluded off and and are, should we list them now or are, do they do they actually still warrant listing and so they sat on that candidate species list from the mid to late 90s until the 2000 2010 2012 somewhere 2014. 14, 2014, I think is when it was. So, sorry to do that. I just wanted to provide some context to what you're talking about. Right. And so then uh, there was a listing decision. They were listed as a threatened species. There was a bunch of litigation. There are five states where the lesser prairie chicken resides. Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas. Kansas has the bulk of of lesser chickens. 
over 50%, I think, out of those. And so, uh, it, and it's largely based upon that grass system that we have, you know, that short to mid grass. And uh, so, uh, as a result of that litigation, or as a result of that uh, listing, then we had to change our prairie chicken hunting seasons. Uh, hunting really has no impact, but, but you know, taking threatened or endangered birds really wasn't in our bailiwick at that and time. And you used to allow, uh, you used to have a hunting season for lesser prairie chickens. We had a before that listing decision. Yes, we had a we had a seg that portion of the state where lesser chickens resided. We had a diminished bag limit, but a, a and a short, slightly shorter season than the rest of the state. So. Most people thought of it as greater and lesser prairie chicken seasons, but you could shoot a greater prairie chicken or lesser prairie chicken in that zone in the southwest part of the state. Um, but it was really set up more restrictive because, because of the existence chicken. of lesser prairie chickens. Yeah. And it was one a day, and it was about a five-week season. And I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was pretty de minimis. Maybe five, 600 birds a year got shot. And so... Um, but then when the listing occurred, we expanded that zone to include areas where we thought they, you know, might be, and then we went farther than that. So, so you got a built-in a buffer. A so you, buffer. So you had, here's where we think the lesser prairie chickens are. Here's where they think, here's where we think there might be lesser prairie chickens and greater prairie chickens and Mixed so mixing together. And here's a buffer on top of that just in case. Right. And so uh, that basically shut down anything south of the interstate in western Kansas, I-70, south to the border in southwest Kansas. Um, and so uh, we still have greater prairie chicken hunting, uh, and it, we have an early season, a walk-up season, which is about a month in September in October. It goes September 15 to October 15, roughly. And then... We reopen a season uh, the week after our pheasant season opens. And pheasants are big game bird here in Kansas. You know, people yeah. come here to shoot pheasants. And uh, the, but they can have a mixed bag hunt. On the on the lesser prairie chicken side, it, so uh, procedurally, we had that. There was that. They were listed in 2014. And then there was litigation. Uh, and ultimately, in a case in West Texas. There were cases all over the place. Right. So there had been five lawsuits filed o over lesser prairie chicken. Like we had two lawsuits filed in Washington, D.C., two lawsuits filed in Oklahoma, and a lawsuit filed in West Texas. You had the folks in, this is just an interesting procedural thing, mm -hmm. and, and it's kind of me nerding out for a second. Um, but you had the folks in D.C. Uh, that had tran uh, um, made a motion to the court to transfer that venue to Oklahoma. Correct. And those in Oklahoma were making a motion, some of the groups in Oklahoma, making a motion to transfer those cases to D.C. Right. And what you wound up having uh, was the two cases in Oklahoma and the two cases in D.C. just swapped places because those motions to transfer were granted by the various judges. And so you still had five cases going on, uh, but... Four of them had just switched places. Right, right. And then the judge in West Texas was like, forget those guys. We're just going to move ahead. So while all that procedural nonsense was going on in West Texas, the judge was like, we're just going to deal with this thing. And that judge made a decision that the Fish and Wildlife Service had failed to analyze the effects of a conservation plan for lesser prairie chickens, uh, had failed to adequately analyze the effects of that based on a policy that they have, a policy document, which redundantly is called the peace policy, which is the policy to the evaluate conservation effects policy. I don't know why you'd call it a policy of a policy, but that's what they do, uh, right? So that court in West Texas said, you know, Fish and Wildlife Service, you made a mistake, you didn't do your analysis correctly, so this rule to list is no good. And so, therefore, um, lesser prairie chickens are not listed today because of that case. Correct. Um, so they've been back. You're back in state management. Do your, do your, and they, and you have been for several years. Has your hunting closure area changed? No, it's remained the same since then. What's the reason for that? Well, I think there's a perception that 
people think you shouldn't be hunting a bird or that you potentially might have to mitigate for as a threatened or endangered species in the future, even though hunting has no impact on upland birds. I mean, not on pheasants, not on quail. You take birds that are otherwise going to be lost to predation or natural causes. And, uh, but I don't think that uh, there's a will to reopen the season. And as a result, I mean, we talked about that ecotourism opportunity. Some of those things are supplanting or replacing or coming in new, uh, that opportunity to go see things on the lek. People have realized that bird has a lot of value, Mm -hmm. right? Intrinsically and as well as economically. And so, you have people now wanting to I think it might have highlighted the fact that these birds potentially are viewed by some as in trouble and now you have an opportunity to put people on a lek 15 feet away from a bird at sunrise and be able to see that bird up close let me ask you a question about that because I've thought about this some with in regards to sage grouse Um, do you think and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to but do you think that by promoting um, ecotourism in a way that tries to get folks from all over the country in different countries and even within your own state to come out and see these birds on their lek. Do you think that reduces the likelihood that you would have support for a hunting season in the future? And here's why I say that and then I'll let you answer. Um, and I'm thinking about it with respect to sage grouse. So I go out to a sage, you, know, you see a sage grouse in September during hunting season, and it's a t- completely different experience than seeing a sage grouse on a lek in April. You know, in during hunting season, they're flushing up like you would a pheasant or something, or you're seeing them, you know, maybe you're seeing them walking through the sagebrush. You know, you don't see the air sacs. They're not puffing out. They're not fanning their, their feathers. There's no, there's no display. They're just like any other upland bird out there on the landscape that you have your dogs and you're going after and you're looking to flush. Um, but you get out there on the, on that sage grass lake and you hear people talking about, um, how, you know, the populations have been declining for decades and, and there have been, there have been pushes to list them, sage grouse, just the same way there have been pushes to list lesser prairie chicken. And you st- get out there and you look at this and you watch this display of these, the males strutting out, and the bloop, 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 you know, I can't do the sound. Right. Uh, but obviously. <laughs> obviously, yeah. Very, yeah <laughs> my, if my wife's listening, she'll <coughs> make a comment how I can't do accents or sounds or any sound effects of any kind. I should never even try. But they're, you're watching this display and... I wonder if people look at that, they go to these places and see what now is defined or the, as these iconic birds right? and see them and say, how could anybody ever want to hunt those? We shouldn't be hunting those. You know, I kind of, I, I wonder, I wonder, I, don't, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that, if, if, if that's a potential side effect. I think that exists anyway. I think there are lots of people out there who don't understand hunting and conservation and they're, they want to preserve everything but that's just not life and that's not real i mean animals die it's going to happen whether they run into a fence or a car hit by a car or there's a power line or any sort of multitude of things uh i think the the two uh you know the the watching aspect or the ecotourism aspect and the hunting aspect can go hand in hand i i, I don't know that it's going to prevent a hunting season from coming back. I think it's not the watching part that prevents that. It's the people don't think you should mitigate. You shouldn't be mitigating for birds that you're hunting. That's really what it boils down to here anyway. Okay. I'm just, yeah, I'm curious and I don't, I don't need to beat the dead horse here, I guess, but uh, I've, I've seen it. I, I think about, I mean, maybe maybe grizzly bears are different. Right? Maybe grizzly bears are just different. Because I think about about grizzly bears, and, and when I was working with those and dealing with those, the number of people that would call, the, you know, be like, you if you hunt those, I will never come to your state again. Right? 
Right. Those, you know, and yeah. I and I kind of I've just wondered it about sage grouse is is you know this that maybe if they haven't seen one, then they know they're there. They haven't seen one. They're not really attached to it. You know, maybe they don't have any concerns about hunting. But but if they actually come out on the ground, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do this, we promote it. We have a lek watching, a lek viewing right. guide in Wyoming, right? We we promote it. We want people to get out there and see it. But <coughs> if they do come out there and see it, that maybe if they're not a hunter, and then they see that, like, how could anybody want to hunt one of those? And then do we? Yeah, I don't know. I think we have to tell a conservation story. Yeah, that hunters have paid the way to manage these species back from wherever they were. Hunter, I mean. Lesser chickens, for example, are, used to be a game species. Now they're not. But hunters' dollars are paying for the management of that species as, an, as a threat, as a candidate species or a potential threatened or endangered species, as a non-game species. Hunters' dollars are paying for that. So, I, you know, we've got a few other... Kansas doesn't have a lot of endangered species on the federal level, but when you think about it. But like whooping cranes, whooping cranes migrate through. We've got two wetlands of international significance, uh, slightly west of here, about an hour and a half, Cheyenne Bottoms and Quivera National Wildlife Refuge. Incredible diversity of shorebirds that migrate through there. It's also a major waterfowl stopping point. And whooping cranes come through. But as whooping cranes, which once were like 17 birds in 1942 now we have 500 and there will be human interactions with those species it just happens and so can you say that hunting i'm not proposing that we hunt whooping cranes or anything i'm just using this as an example <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, so is hunting less detrimental to uh, the species than uh, a power line or a wind farm or a car or a fence or all the things that we use, there will be human interactions that that are negative to the wildlife. And as endangered species rebound, naturally, those as those numbers go up, there will be more interactions. Uh, are those people who are now watching those birds going to say, well, we should take down that fence or we should take down that power line or we shouldn't drive vehicles? It's just a rhetorical theoretical yeah some of them probably do right yeah so uh but speaking of wetlands of international significance we have an incredible diversity of wildlife species but we get some phenomenal duck hunting and goose hunting in this uh part of the state and the in this part in particular because we have these wetlands that we've built up around these reservoirs but also those major flyway stopping points we're part of the central flyway uh, most of the state is, and then we also have the high plains. Uh, so uh, we actually, uh, as a result, have uh, different seasons within our state. Uh, like the high plains zone, we, we manage slightly differently, and, and then we've got an, uh, low plains early, low plains late, and then a southeast zone. So and we've got incredible turkey populations. We've got... Uh, Easterns in the first two tiers of counties in the eastern part of the state. We've got some hybrids, eastern Rio hybrids. We've got Rios. And then in the far southwest, uh, we did some DNA testing on some birds. And we actually have some Merriam hybrids. Oh, do you? So I was going to. Oh, hybrids. Hybrids. Hybrids with the very, Rios? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. In the very southwest. And when it comes to quail, right now we're in Bob White country, but in the very southwest corner of the state, out on the Cimarron National Grasslands, we've got some scaled quail. So I made a trip out there specifically just to hunt scaled quail one time, just to try it. So we've got a pretty diverse state. It's incredible. And you have a few cats around too, don't you? Cats. Mountain lions? Uh, we've had, I think, 17 since 2007. I think the last one that the last confirmed sighting was in 1905 in Ellis County, which is about two three hours west of here. Wait, wait, 1905. 1905, and then we went all the way to 2007. And and when I first started with the agency, everybody in the world has seen a cat. You know, if I had a nickel for every person who told me they've seen a mountain lion, 
I'd probably be wealthy at this point and retired, but um, we had uh, a confirmed uh, sighting. Well, we had a, a kill of a mountain lion in south central Kansas. And then uh, since then, of course, with trail cams and things like that, we've I, I think we have 17 or 18 confirmed sightings now. But Which it's, means they were probably around for, for quite a while. You just, you know, the advent of trail cams really helps. Well, if they were, though, you'd still have vehicle accidents, and we don't have any vehicle accidents. And most of them are migrants, and some of those sightings are the same cat as it's moved through the state. In I, I know a lot of those, uh, actually a, a source population for a lot of the the cats in Nebraska and Kansas and even that get into Iowa and other places, the Black Hills. The Black Hills. They come exactly. from the Black Hills. There was a radio collared one that got hit by a train in uh, just south of the Kansas border in Oklahoma. Uh, and the radio collar was from the Dakota population. So they'll, young males striking out for new territory will yeah. go quite a distance. Yeah, and I know the Black Hills population is, is strong. I mean, it's it's uh, a robust population right. of cats. Uh, it is. And so I know there's a lot of movement out of that population with males moving other places. But I think that's always interesting is because you get these, and it's not just Kansas, it's farther east even too, these these cats from the Black Hills are traveling great distances. I think one ended up in distances. Connecticut. I think you're right. They so. just travel unbelievable distances. There was a front range cat, like from Fort Collins, that they were that was being monitored and ended up in Western Kansas for a little bit, and then ultimately went down into New Mexico. So I mean, that cat traveled quite a big yeah. distance. Yeah, low range. So if I were to pick one thing, one thing I'm supposed to do in Kansas, if I'm a if I'm a hunter or angler. What, what is that? I don't know if I can come up with one because we have, I mean, people come here to hunt whitetails. Uh, people want to come here and shoot nice whitetails. I mean, and we're lucky we had our our season, modern season didn't start till 1965. Uh, so it's fairly new in the scheme of things. It's 50 years old, but um, that's what people want to do. It's difficult to to come hunt in Kansas, you got to know where you're going to hunt before you apply for the permit. Cause, because of the land ownership. Because of the land ownership. And uh, every year I have people who call and they're like, hey, I drew a permit, now where do I go? And I'm like, you're doing it in reverse. <laughs> got to have the place to go before you draw the permit. Uh, turkey hunting is incredible. We have usually have very high success rates. Uh, we have Kansas got hit with a bunch of flooding this year, as did the Dakotas and Nebraska, and we're still in flood stages. The reservoir uh, next to us is like 48 feet over conservation pool. Is that the one we were fishing in? No, that one's like 32 feet over conservation pool. That so was amazing to, to see as we're as we're in the water, and the the guide is saying, "See that light post? Right. That's where the." The boat ramp. The top of is. the boat ramp starts. <laughs> yeah, and we're and, and we're several hundred yards from shore at this point. The light post is about four feet out of water at that point. Yeah. So yeah, I mean it's uh water is high. Um so I we've got this flooding problem which will probably impact our turkey reproduction this year, but turkeys uh, spring is one of my favorite times of the year. I mean spring and fall, right? Uh Springs a close second to my fall, uh, just because you can shed hunt, you can shoot hunt turkeys, you can gather mushrooms. There's all sorts of things going on right then, and then fishing turns on, and we've got some incredible fishing, and the white bass run starts about then. But we've got great walleye populations. People don't know that about Kansas, but we're like on the southern edge of, edge of walleye country, and so. Uh, we have a growing season where we can pack on more pounds per fish. We've got wipers. We've got um, our fisheries division has an early bass spawn uh, technique that allows us to put those fish in the reservoir earlier so they they get bigger quicker. Um, it's amazing. So we've got uh, an incredible diversity. I don't know that I can just pick out one. I love to upland bird hunt uh, as well, and, you know, we've got that country in the northwest part of the state that's a mixed bag hunt pheasants quail huh. prairie chickens so it's basically you're telling folks you know just come to kansas come and to do kansas it all. figure it out you can do it it's all. fun yeah give us a call and we'll try to help you 
I and I believe that cuz that's what you do. Uh we've had some <laughs> we had some fun uh fun the past couple of days, but fun last year doing a, uh, that was technically not in Kansas, but in Missouri. It was close. Right close. Right real close, real close. Uh yeah. Um anything else that you want to touch on about about Kansas wildlife, about the uh opportunities here or some of the you know, maybe some of the challenges you're facing, some you know, what are some of the big issues that you that you have to deal with? Yeah. Yeah, I you know, I mean we're running on time here, but uh I think, you know, what's important for us is that partnership with landowners. And without that partnership with landowners and it's not our partnership also, it's the hunters and anglers partnerships with those landowners and and, and conservation is collaborative, and you just can't get it done unless you collaborate with people. I think that's a that's a perfect message. That's a message that I'm always trying to uh, impart on people too. How collaboration is key. Seventy percent of this country is in private ownership, so partnerships with the landowner community are essential to having a vibrant wildlife population. And no place exemplifies that more than a state like Kansas, where you. You said ninety-seven percent privately owned. It's privately owned, um, so that's a. I think that's a great takeaway. The only state in the nation that has less private land than us by geographic size is Rhode Island. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that that puts it in perspective. It's perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that creates some challenges, but some opportunities too. Right. Opportunities for great partnerships and uh, uh, and stewardship. So. Before we, before we sign off, I got to ask you. I've asked you before because you've been on this before, so you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. Um, but you know the drill. You know that when somebody comes on this, we always ask them, "What's your mountain?" Right. We want to know what that what that special place is for you. I uh, know you've talked about it before, but if you have another one, sure. My mountain is. I've always got mountains. Yeah. Climbing certain mountains at certain times, and yeah. where my place is to go, and. I think the first time we were on, we talked about, uh, you know, bobber fishing with my kids, and it takes it back to uh, childhood and how much fun that is. We we try to bobber fish a lot, and then, you know, the next mountain was what's on my bucket list the second time, which is, you know, I have this crazy goal of getting my kids to all 50 states before they leave the house and and uh, hunting on every continent. And uh, <clears throat> so I guess my current my next mountain is Argentina is what I'm looking at for next year is I'm kind of making a plan that I'm going to end up in Argentina, but I just had the opportunity to check off, uh, Europe. I hunted, uh, for roe deer. I went to England and got to stalk roe deer for three days, which I thought would be vastly different than what it was. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I ended up walking about 39 miles in three days, according to the GPS, so uh, a lot of stalking, and it was super fun, and these little deer, and it was challenging, super challenging. I, th- I thought it would be a lot easier than what it was, but it was a hard hunt. That sounds like the topic of another uh Right, another we episode. could spend probably an hour on <laughs> road deer <laughs> yeah, right, stalking. Right, right. Yeah, maybe we'll have to do that. <clears throat> uh, the game, well, at, to that point, the gamekeeper over there, It's a pr- uh, game is owned by the landowner and the gamekeeper operates much the way we do as wildlife managers so we had incredible conversations about pollinators and things like that so we can spend a whole hour on that sometime yeah yeah that sounds fun well hey thanks thanks again for doing this and i think by the way i think we survived okay without mike and nephi yeah we don't need mike and nephi mike and nephi uh we don't need a list of predetermined questions we they, can just go they cut me out of the last episode anyway so i you know now this is my payback uh is i'm doing one without them right no we'll we just <clears throat> we're we're traveling around a lot we got a lot going on for work and so it's been tough to line up our schedules to to get the content out so we take what we you know we do it when we can do it and sometimes we're all together sometimes we're not and so this is one where we weren't all together but i think we we uh we got through it um, I think it's great, and I really appreciate your time. Uh, yeah, anytime. Been here. I've had, it's, a, it's, had a blast. Yeah, may have to do this again in the future. Right. It's always fun. Maybe episode 97. Maybe something there, somewhere thereabouts, yeah. Uh, so it's always fun. For for those of you listening, you know, last last thing I'd say before I sign off is 
we really appreciate the the comments, the feedback back we get from you on our social media pages, uh, through email. You know, the sometimes, a lot of times, the episodes that we do come from listeners like you sub- saying, "Hey, we'd love to learn more about this topic. Could you do a podcast on it?" And so, if you've got ideas for episodes, let us know. If you got feedback, let us know. If we're missing the mark, let us know. Uh, you know, find us on our our uh, gerrymandering. So, yeah, I'm just saying. Okay, well, we we heard the feedback on that episode. <laughs> we won't do any more <laughs> census or gerrymandering episodes. All right, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> uh, message received. Uh, and, and we did receive that, me- <laughs> that message, and we'll take that feedback. Uh, but do do hit us up on our uh, social media, our Instagram. LinkedIn, not LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Our our handles are at It's Your Mountain. You can get us through email at Your Mountain at It's Your Mountain dot com. Um, so so get us that feedback. If you haven't done it yet, please 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 head out to uh, uh, iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and give us that five star rating. Leave us a review. That's the stuff that motivates us. We're not. We're not in this to make money. We're in this to make content. And the thing that keeps us motivated to make content is knowing that people appreciate what we're putting out there. So do that for us. We'd really appreciate it. And remember always that life is about experiences. So go have one.